and thank you for joining us today for our symbiosis and survival webinar um, brought to you by the Weasel Head Glamour Park Preservation Society. Uh, we will be diving right into the heart of ecology to explore the fascinating world of symbiosis, which includes parasitism, mutualism, commensalism, and more. Um, and we're going to explore the profound interconnectivity that sustains our ecosystem and all the ecosystems in our whole biosphere, in the, in the world. Um, there we go. I, I want to thank you all for being here today and engaging with us to learn about ecosystems. Um, I'm speaking to you today from Calgary. I'm not sure where you are all joining us from. Um, if you want to post that in the chat, uh, I'd love to hear where you are, where you are listening from today. Um, I would like to start off by saying that we are all treaty people, meaning that we're all part of caring for the land that cares for us and ensuring that it will be able to support generations after us and provide humans and other organisms with a high quality of life. Uh, we are all part of caring for, learning from, and listening to each other and building connections so that we can learn from the past and change our approaches in the present and future. We all have a part in upholding collective agreements and working together to identify, challenge, and remove oppressive systems in our lives and society. I want to start with this uh, as a lens for you to listen to the rest of the presentation with. So I encourage you to consider the ways that you can extrapolate from some of the principles that we'll discuss today. And bring them into your own life or consider how those sorts of principles will play out or do play out in your life. Um, and perhaps we can, we can work towards building relationships and a thriving, equitable, inclusive, compassionate, resilient society. Um, we're going to be talking lots about resilience today um, uh, in the lens of biodiversity. So I'm very excited to expand on that topic a little bit. Um, if you've not taken the time, again, to read the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada's 94 Calls to Action, or the White Goose Swine Report, which is specific to the Calgary area, um, I definitely encourage you to take a look at it. Um, but I'm going to start off with where, where is the Weasel Head? Um, the Weasel Head is a natural area park in the southwest quadrant of Calgary, uh, or Mohinstis. Uh, we are the Weaselhead Glimmer Park Preservation Society. We're kind of a friends of group, a nonprofit that formed in 1994 by people who are very passionate, and many of them are still uh, a part of the society today as our uh, board members and volunteers and even working as contractors and naturalists. Um, they're very passionate about preserving the biodiversity and ecological health of the Weaselhead and the North and South Glimmer Parks as well. Um, and you can see this, actually, can you see my mouse okay? I think so. Um, so this is the weasel head here, right where the Elbow River meets the Glenmore Reservoir. Yeah. Um, this webinar is presented as part of our educational mandate, mandate as well as our invasive plant management program. Um, our invasive plant management program is funded by the Land Stewardship Center uh, through their watershed stewardship grant this year and through public donations as well. Um, we do a lot of different activities, um, but I can come back to that towards the end, or you can check out our website if you want to learn some more about that. Um, the Land Stewardship Center uh, does support a lot of really incredible projects, so I recommend you check out their website um and see what else they are involved with and just a quick note about myself um my name's dylan i uh, my pronouns are she and they uh, i am a biologist and environmental scientist i work with the weasel head as a naturalist researcher and invasive plant program coordinator um and my background is in zoology i studied at the university of calgary and the university of glasgow i've been working in environmental education and consulting as an environmental scientist uh, slash biologist for about eight years now. Um, and this is some of what my work looks like here. Um, I largely work in groundwater supply, watershed health, wetland health and delineation, invasive plant management and site reclamation. 
but I do have particular interests beyond my ecology work uh, in the realms of environmental intersectionality and economics, uh, accessibility and neurodivergence, sociology, um, and psychology. So I, I do, I do really love bringing those uh, perspectives into my work. Um, I've been with the Weasel Head for about four years now, or almost four years, and I'm very grateful for all all the chances I get to share my knowledge as well as share in the passions and knowledge of all the, the people I meet here. Um, today we're going to be talking about ecological relationships and how these relationships govern population dynamics and balance, uh, ecological uh, resilience, ecosystem services. Uh, we'll also talk about how these concepts relate to invasive plant management, companion plant gardening, permaculture, and regenerative farming. I know it's only an hour, but we're going to get through a lot today. Um, we will go through the underlying principles of ecology and evolutionary theory, define different types of symbiosis, and then return to some examples of these and um, some big picture applications of these concepts. Ecology is the study of relationships of organisms to each other and their physical world. An ecosystem is a community of organisms and their physical environment. It's a complex interconnected system. It all comes down to relationships and resources. Um, each ecosystem has a number of living biotic factors and non-living abiotic factors. Um, these factors affect what is able to live in an ecosystem and even population dynamics over time. These factors are not static. Ecosystems are very dynamic, they're subject to change, and disturbances like fires, storms, floods, human activity uh, can disrupt, disrupt their structure. However, ecosystems have incredible ability to recover and reorganize. Um, this is a process known as ecological succession. Uh, succession is the gradual process of sequential change in species composition and ecosystem structure over time and involves the replacement of one group of dominant species by another in a very specific sequence uh, with each stage preparing the environment for the next stage. Uh, and a lot of this is mitigated or managed by the relationship between biotic and abiotic factors. Um, Ecosystems provide us with invaluable benefits known as ecosystem services, and we will talk about this later. But these include everything from clean air, water to drink, uh, pollination of our crops, food, uh, the regula uh, regulation of climate and disease. In essence, ecosystems support human well-being, as well as all the other organisms, in countless ways. There we are. And I hope you had a chance to take a read through some of these uh, different factors. There we go. And we're going to start at the very beginning with our food web and our trophic levels. But these only capture a portion of the relationships that, that govern um, and manage population dynamics and ecosystem health. So we have our food web on the right. It's showing who eats who at the zoo. Um, it's a relationship of producers uh, who are photosynthesizing uh, organisms, predators, herbivores, scavengers, and decomposers. Uh, it's, it's a visual representation of the complex network of feeding relationships between species. To better understand that those food webs, we can move it over and take a look at trophic levels as well. So if you look at the left side of the, the slide there, um, Trophic levels relate to or refer to an organism's position in the flow of energy through an ecosystem. Troph actually means nourishment. So an autotroph is a plant that makes its own, or an organism that makes its own food. All right. Um, and we can move on from there. We know our uh, predation and herbivory relationships. So I think we can dive in a little bit deeper. We're going to have our evolutionary crash course here. I think many of us will recognize the fellow on the left there. Um, pretty famous dude named Darwin, um, often referred to as the grandfather of, of evolution. Um, now evolution is a process of change over time in living organisms, but it's governed by four principles. And these are key. First among those we have variation among individuals. These are all 
all individuals, all separate, but you can see differences in their coloration pretty distinctly. Inheritance, we got some beautiful uh, Mendelian genetics here, a uh, classic experiment that actually proved um, uh, different modes of inheritance. Um, so the inheritance of genetic materials and traits from parents to offspring. Selection, um, not all individuals reproduce successfully and variation among individuals contributes to variation in successful reproduction which results in a change in the presence um, or proportion of that genetic material in the next generation. So <laughs> there's, there's different behaviors that will result in shorter or longer lifespans and therefore more opportunities for reproduction, for example, as we see with this rat actually chasing a cat. There's a video for it and it's, it's quite wild. Time is our last of our four governing principles. Selection results in changes in populations over time. And this can happen in a relatively short amount of time if the um, rate of reproduction is quite quick and the age of reproductive maturity is quite short. But this can also take a very, very long time there's lots of organisms that will reach um, decades uh, old of ages um, before they're actually reproductively viable. Um, and a very, very quick note that gets a, it's a bee in every evolutionary biologist bought it. This is critical. This is important. Evolution is not directional. Something cannot be more evolved or less evolved and success is not correlated with complexity or specificity. Um, success can occur with complexity or specificity, but it can also occur with reductions in complexity. Um, species don't always move towards increasing complexity. The whale is a really great example of that. You can see the loss of certain bones, certain features, um, leaving only vestigial uh, bones uh, in, its, in its final form. Um, evolution is governed by random variation, which may or may not result in a benefit towards survival and reproduction. So there's a large part of evolution that's governed by chance. We're getting to the meat and potatoes now. Um, the survival and reproductive success of organisms are impacted by the biotic and abiotic factors of their environment. In other words, species face selective pressures that, uh, from both the physical environment and their relationships. Both the feeding relationships we talked about earlier, the predator-prey relationships or herbivory relationships, as well as the relationships of symbiosis. Now, symbiosis is a umbrella term, and it's any type of close and long-term biological interaction between different species. Um, I will put a little asterisk here. Um, you can have sexual parasitism in some organisms within the same species, um, and that is one of the more common types of um, parasitism that occurs in, within a species. Um, but generally, it's always between different species. Um, symbiotic relationships can be beneficial or harmful to either organism in the relationship. And each organism in the relationship is called a symbiont. The balance of benefits and harms are what is used to define the type of symbiotic relationship. Um, I do really love the simplicity of, of the plus minus or plus zero. Um, and this diagram is such a wonderful way of being able to visualize these different relationships. Um, now, there's actually quite a few bit, uh, more on there than we usually hear about. Uh, the classics are mutualism, both species benefit. Commensalism, one benefits, the other doesn't really have an impact. And parasitism, one benefits, one is harmed. And we also have immensalism where one doesn't really have an effect and one is harmed. Neutralism, they're not affecting each other. It's hard to say if this is really a symbiotic relationship or not, uh, because if they have no effect on each other, 
How closely associated are they? And lastly, competition. And this is another one that uh, can happen within a species as well. Um, and this is where both organisms are harmed by that relationship or that interaction. It can be really hard to quantify uh, the impacts of interactions between different species. And so certain relationships are sometimes categorized in one and then sometimes in another. Um, and it can be depending on the context, the researcher who's speaking about it, um, new data that's come about, um, and what considerations are involved in making that decision. Um, so a lot of times it's the general effect is positive or the general effect is negative. Um, as organisms evolve, as at as the result of selective pressure applied by their symbiotic relationships, we end up seeing species co-evolve. Uh, species that have lived in association with each other for a long time often have co-evolved. You can see this exemplified by the incredible specificity of parasitoid or hyperparasitoid species. And hyperparasitoids are parasites of parasites. Very, very cool. Um, we can even see this between the specificity between some flowers and their pollinators. Um, the hawk moth is a great example with its incredibly long uh, proboscis. Uh, I've chosen this example here with orchid mantises um, because in the image on the left, you can see that this orchid mantis is standing out. It's on a leaf. It doesn't look like it's camouflaged at all. However, this orchid mantis has been co-evolving with its prey, which does not see it in the same wavelengths that human eyes see in. Um, they tend to use UV frequencies uh, to, to visualize their world. Um, and so it has not evolved with us in mind. Uh, so we can see it very easily. Uh, however, if you look at the image on the right there, uh, this is kind of a B camera is what, what they're called. Um, and it's has, uh, it has false coloration added to it afterwards. And you can see that the flower on the right and the orchid mantis on the left have the same coloration. And so when that orchid mantis is in the right shape, um, it can very easily trick a bee, where when we look at it, it doesn't trick us. This is an example of a predator prey relationship. Um, but a great example of how that co-evolution has shaped uh, the, the traits that the orchid mantis is um, showing. There we go. Now, parasitism is that one species benefits, one species is harmed relationship. There are a number of different types. Um, you can have ectoparasites on the surface, endo on the inside, mesoparasites, brood or social parasites, kleptoparasitism, and sexual parasites. Um, and there are an incredible amount of parasites out there. Um, many of them look like what you think of when you hear the word parasite, but there's many that might surprise you. On the right, this is a coral root. Um, it is a parasitic plant. Uh, as, as you can see, there's no green in the emergent portion of the plant. Um, this is because it doesn't photosynthesize. It steals its energy. Um, its roots will connect to the roots of other organisms growing in the, the environment. And it will begin to siphon off the sugars that are stored in those roots in order to get its own energy. So there are many flowers that are parasites too. Um, Parasitism strategies are divided into two main categories, and there's six major strategies. Um, for our transmission-based strategies, we have direct, trophic, and vector. So direct is when the parasite is able to um, latch itself onto you, um, find its way to you on its own. Trophic would be if the host has to consume the parasite vector is through another 
organism uh, or another action that actually brings the parasite to the host. Um, we also have effect-based categorization of parasite strategies. Um, there are castrators who take the majority of the energy that would be used towards reproduction in the host species and use it themselves. They often will modify significantly the form um, or the morphology of the host um, and leave no energy for that species to reproduce anymore. Uh, parasitoids are parasites that ultimately kill their host. Uh, so it's kind of a delayed um, relationship. Um, but it differs from our predator prey relationships in that it's not a direct kill. Um, it's often side effects that can lead to that, that death or um, that death does not occur, occur right away. We also have micro predators. Um, a lot of these are blood feeding species such as mosquitoes and they will eat, um, they will feed from a number of different organisms uh, so that they don't kill any one of those organisms or generally don't. Uh, at the top right here, we have a picture of a brown headed cowbird uh, as a brood parasite with the, uh, within an Eastern Phoebe nest. Um, to our eyes, it really stands out. You can see the difference and you can pick up the one that doesn't belong there. However, to the Eastern Phoebe, that egg is blended in. Again, another example of coevolution where the signals that they are sending are directed to the ways that these organisms sense the world around them. The bottom one is uh, a moose pelt with a lot of moose winter ticks on it. Um, this is an example of an ectoparasite. Um, these are direct transmission parasites. So they will detect animals moving um, as well as detect the carbon dioxide that we breathe out. And that will give them a cue to jump onto the animal moving by and parasitize them. Um, some other examples of parasites. We've got that uh, mosquito, um, that uh, vector, uh, actually it's a mode of uh, vector transmission for other parasites that can affect humans. Um, but it itself is direct, it finds its way to us. Um, we have a schistosome up here. This is actually what makes a swimmer's itch. Um, this is a mesoparasite and it will burrow into the uh, outer bit of the waterfowl's skin. Um, it will change from a schist schistosome at that point into another form of its life cycle and complete its process. Um, and down at the bottom here, this is a snail, but it's a snail that's gone through pretty extreme modification. Um, a flatworm of, uh, is parasitizing um, the snail and the snail has these banded pulsating structures visible on the tentacles of the snail. But those banded pulsating tentacles are actually um, sporocyst brood sacs filled with sicariae, which are a very specific timing of, or part of the life cycle of that flatworm. Um, the sicariae need to be ingested by a bird to develop to the adult stage. So this is a parasite that requires multiple hosts and it's an obligate um, that this species has those hosts in order to complete its life cycle. Um, in order to get the snail eaten by a bird, those changes in colors and the pulsations in the tentacles of the snail increases the visibility to potential birds that would eat the snail. Um, I did want to include this image, but I'm not sure how much we're going to dive into it today. Um, but this is from a really recent paper uh, from 2021. And the researchers were looking at just how broadly 
the interactions in a entire ecosystem, this freshwater community were affected by signaling that was actually originating from the parasites and not their hosts, or it was altered by the hosts, uh, parasites. Um, many of these interactions do include non predator prey, uh, relationships. Um, and a lot of these in this, this study, uh, these relationships are mediated by what are called oxy lipids. Um, and those ones are shown in the dotted lines and you can see just how many of the interactions on there are those dotted lines. So relationships mediated by those oxylipids, which are modified by the trematodes, the parasites that are living in a number of these species. Well, some really fresh and new research just to show just how widespread um, the consequences or the actions of parasites can be in a whole ecosystem. Now, I do want to jump into commensalism. Uh, there are a couple different specific forms. Um, if we're looking at inequilism, um, inquilinism, a great example would be moss on a tree um, or epiphytic um, uh, plants growing on a tree. Um, some would argue that this is actually um, a, a, a harmful interaction, a, a parasitic relationship because the plants are stealing some nutrients that would otherwise be going to the tree. Um, but this is generally categorized as a commensalist relationship. So on the top right there, we've got a lichen uh, growing on a branch. It's not hard, hurting the tree um, and it has better access to the resources it needs. Um, and that could be light and moisture, and it could be away from predators that would happily nibble up the lichen. Um, metabiosis is often exemplified by hermit crabs, where they use the shell uh, from a dead gastropod for protection. Um, but I found a study um, from Eastern Canada looking at a native bee species that has started using a um, invasive snail species, uh, the shells of these species, um, to brood their, uh, to incubate their offspring in. Um, so I'll get to that in a little bit. I have a picture for you. Uh, we also have porosity. This could be everything from mites living on insects, um, millipedes traveling on birds, um, pseudoscorpions living on mammals, uh, Seeds transported on fur or in the mud on hooves. Um, it can also be obligate or facultative. So there are some mites, some um, invertebrates that will live their whole life on another organism. So that organism is providing them their biota, their habitat. And finally, our microbiota. Um, we've usually come across this concept in the lens of um, what lives on our skin and what lives in our gut. Um, some scientists disagree whether this is truly a type of commensalism um, instead of mutualism. So in the case of gut microbiota, uh, there are quite a few organisms that uh, assist our digestive tract or our digestive processes. In the case of skin flora, um, there's evidence that some of that bacteria will confer some protection uh, for the host. Oh, don't freeze, there we go. Um, we also see the brown-headed cowbird yet again. In this relationship with the bison, it has a um, commensalist relationship instead of a parasitic uh, relationship. And as the bison is grazing and moving through grasslands, it will scare up different insects. It will uh, disrupt them from the grass and the cowbirds will then swoop down and catch that without having to scrounge through the grasses themselves. Uh, we also can see a, um, a seed that will catch onto the fur of a number of different species that will move through its habitat. Um, 
a jackrabbit, a white-tailed jackrabbit hiding in under undergrowth is another example of um, a commensalist relationship in many cases. Uh, sometimes it's also um, uh, mutualistic depending on what the species is and how it responds to foraging uh, or herbivory. Um, but in this case, the jackrabbit is gaining the benefit of shelter or camouflage. Um, and the plant is just there. It's not really getting affected. Um, one of my favorites uh, examples of commensalism is actually gulls, insect gulls. At the bottom left corner there, we have the goldenrod gull. Uh, this is created by either the goldenrod fly or the goldenrod wasp. And they are even named after the plant that they have a relationship with because this is obligate and they cannot survive without the goldenrod. They will lay their eggs in the stem or various parts of the plant. In this case, it is the stem. And the egg will have um, a number of uh, fake plant hormones uh, that will be released that tricks the plant into growing certain tissues. And so the plant begins to build this really thick, uh, dense home around the egg, this wonderful shelter for the egg. And the egg will be able to develop in there, grow into a larva, eventually pupate and emerge as an adult. Now, some may also categorize this as a parasitic relationship instead of commensalist, depending on how much energy is used by the plant create those galls. I tend to think of galls as um, kind of an analogous situation to what high elves do in, in fiction um, or in high fantasy, what elves do. Um, you've ever heard of stories where the elves sing to the trees and the trees build a home and it's beautiful and gorgeous. Um, that's kind of what these animals have actually achieved with these plants. They have figured out how to communicate with these plants to get these plants to do what they need them to do. Uh, and these galls are often really, really dense. And so it's very difficult for uh, prey species such as birds to actually peck away at them. If you're walking through the weasel head, you can find these all over the place. Take a peek at them. If there's a nice, tiny little neat hole, that means the, uh, the fly or the wasp escape successfully. If it's been torn open, a bird did manage to get in there. And this is really important for the broader ecosystem because in the middle of the winter, these invertebrates, uh, these insects are um, happily tucked away inside their galls, but they become one of the few really high protein uh, sources of food that are readily available. They're a bit more effort, but they're still available. And now the picture of the bee up at the top left there, um, this, is, this is that bee I was talking about that was in that research study um, that has figured out how to use snails, uh, this invasive species of snails or alien species, I should say, it's been kind of categorized as benign, um, to lay its eggs in and incubate them. Um, and so this would be an example of that, uh, that uh, meta metabiosis um, form of commensalism that we talked about earlier. On the right here, these are really, really, really tiny mites living on uh, some species of Hymenoptera. Uh, it looks like some sort of wasp. Um, and this wasp is not impacted by these at all. They are living there and the wasp is doing its own thing. Um, they're provided with habitat and the wasp doesn't even notice. There we go. And that brings us to mutualism. Um, there can be a number of different types of mutualistic relationships. Um, similar to our other types, um, they can be internal, external, partially embedded, uh, behavioral, it could be obligate, facultative. Um, and a, a classic example is a relationship between flowers and pollinators. Here we'll see um, uh, with B 
Bees, for example, they'll consume nectar and pollen for energy and protein. And most of the pollen is used to feed larvae. However, a lot of it collects on their, um, on their body as they move to other flowers. And those flowers get cross-pollination, uh, which increases uh, biodiversity or genetic diversity. And that allows the species to be more resilient over time. It also allows for um, that species to evolve more easily to changes. So if there's more variation, there's more chance that those variations may lend themselves towards a beneficial uh, change in their, their behavior or their phenotype, their physical uh, traits. Um, many unrelated and very different forms of lichens, including mushroom forming fungi. Um, and a lot of these are cup fungi from the uh, as ascomycetes um, are in relationship, in such close relationship with their symbionts that we see them as being one species. Um, if we go to the next picture here, we actually get what, <laughs> what comprises a lichen. Um, on the left, we have a green algae species. Um, and this recipe here is for a lichen that grows right here in Alberta, freckled pelt. We've got our fungi and we've got our cyanobacteria and they each contribute to the overall organism. Now, some of these species can live outside of this relationship. Uh, it's facultative. However, many fungi actually contain organisms that are unable to reproduce unless they are together in that union. And here is the magic recipe. We end up with our freckled pelt. It's pretty fascinating. And this is not the only example of such close association between mutualist symbionts. In fact, the very origins of our existence and the existence of all eukaryotic organisms, which is going way back into domain, um, is from, or theorized to be from and, and highly supported from symbiotic relationships. Now, I'm not going to jump too much into this, um, but we have our prokaryotic, um, organisms that over time actually came into association where our archaea and our bacteria, essentially, or, or early bacteria, uh, came into relationship and we got mitochondria. You can see it really well in here. Um, so that archaea and that bacteria are having a very, very close relationship, so much so that that, that bi bacteria becomes an endosymbiont and eventually it becomes an obligate relationship. And eventually it only exists within that symbiotic relationship. Um, what's really neat is mitochondria actually have a, a different DNA than the rest of your cells. You can trace mitochondrial DNA, um, which is, is part of this relationship, this organelle, this part of your cell was actually another organism and they found symbiotic relationships together, um, mutual benefit, uh, benefits, um, so much so they made it permanent. And this does continue on as well. Later on, if I go back to the last picture, you can see a second uh, merger. Um, this is when cyanobacteria merged with those early eukaryotic cells um, and led to the formation of plants. So these eukaryotic cells um, brought in this other organelle, this other organism that became an organelle, um, which was able to photosynthesize. And so the origin of plants is tied into symbiosis. The origin of all eukaryotic life is tied to endosymbiosis. Uh, all right, I'm gonna go really quickly through this, but I have a story for you. <laughs> all right. This occurs right here uh, in Calgary, in the Weasel Head. Um, 
There's the balsam poplar tree on the right, the balsam poplar borer beetle, uh, Saperda calcarea. Um, the adults of this beetle will feed on the leaves and the barks, uh, the bark of these trees uh, on young twigs. They lay their eggs in the slits that they cut into the bark. And they can tell this is a poplar tree. This is the one, that's where I'm laying my egg. The eggs hatch and they begin to eat the inner liver, living layer of the tree, the cambium. And then they penetrate deep into the center of the tree towards the heartwood. Eventually they pupate and emerge as adults from the tree. But this can take a really long time. This process is about three to four years for these beetles. Now these beetles also have a fungal sy a symbiont. Um, it's from the order, oh, Ophiostomatales. There we go. Um, the beetles carry the fungus in mycangia, which are special uh, structures actually evolved and designed to carry that fungi with them. And they inoculate the tree with it. Um, for some similar species, the fungi is actually the primary source of food and their burrowing creates a optimal habitat for that fungus. Um, for others, the fungi appears to be more um, used to help break down the wood into digestible components for the beetles. Now the beetles can moderate the population of balsam poplars by reducing the energy available for the tree to grow and reproduce. Um, but there's also hyperparasitoids of this beetle. They'll lay their eggs in the larva of that beetle and eventually consume the larva, pupate, and then emerge as adults. All right, the beetles will become food for woodpeckers. That's our beetle, that's our poplar tree. This is our hyperparasitoid. You've actually probably seen these around if you're in the Calgary area, and now you know what they are. All right, now these beetles become food for woodpeckers. These trees will die, and in time, other insects will move into the tree. The death of this tree will open up the canopy, allowing light to reach the forest floor and stimulating understory growth. We'll get some fresh young saplings that will refresh the uh, demographics of the forest and prevent too many of these insects from populating the forest. That's when we get something like the uh, mountain pine beetle infestation, simply too many of them. And that's when they start to invade healthy trees. Um, now, young saplings are going to entice grazers to the area, such as deer. Um, this will prevent too many saplings from growing all in one area, reducing competition. Now, these deer are going to be moving through the area. They have broad ranges. They're going to carry seeds with them in their fur or on their hooves. This is called epizookery. Um, and they will also be eating some of the, the vegetation around here, some seeds and berries as well, which will also become viable once uh, viable to germinate once they pass through their digestive system. The woodpeckers create holes in the trees that they are searching for and will often choose to excavate trees that have their hardwood softened by fungus. And just like those beetles, they will inoculate the new trees they are harvesting from with that fungus, creating future potential nest sites. Now, other species such as chickadees and owls, that's a sawwet owl on the right, black capped chickadee on the left, um, even at wood ducks, um, flying squirrels, bats, will often come to live in these woodpecker holes. Um, increases in tree holes for nesting in isolated studies um, has been shown to directly increase population densities for a number of species, including chickadees. Um, chickadees will also excavate their own nest holes too but they are far less uh, skilled at it. You can see their, their peaks are quite tiny, um, but they do manage it. Um, but when they find one, when they don't have to put in the work, they will absolutely go for it and be a secondary cavity nester using someone else's nest. Now, chickadees eat large amounts of invertebrates. Um, about 80% of its diet is made of insects, invertebrates. Um, during their breeding season and about 50% or less during the winter, but they're one of the most important pest exterminators in the forest. Um, now, greater chickadee density would lead to increased predation of insects, lowering the percentage of successful adult poplar borers that lay eggs. But as the chickadee population increases, their predators, such as the northern shrike and hawks, would also increase um, because of the increased availability of food, the chickadees. 
Now snakes, mice, squirrels, uh, weasels, they all enter the chickadee's nest and they, they will eat eggs or young birds. So their populations will also start to rise. Now, red squirrels are omnivores, but they eat considerable amounts of seeds from conifers. White spruce is the conifer that lives in the weasel head area. They cache large amounts of seeds, uh, the red squirrels do, and they don't retrieve them all. So they end up helping to plant more trees in the area that they are eating from. Um, now, the increase of these predators will lead to competition for food and a decline in food availability resulting in population decline over time and on and on and on. And this is what I feel like when I, when I get on a roll, um, this, and ultimately this is the end consequence of this whole roller coaster of relationships is an ecologist going like this. Now, this is only one thin tangle of the web of interconnectivity that governs population dynamics and ecosystem resilience. Um, in this story alone, we see parasitism between the poplar borer, the balsam tree, parasitism between the beetle and the parasitic wasp, mutualism between the wood digesting fungus and the woodpecker, as well as the uh, poplar borer, beetle, and the fungi. Um, we also have predation between the woodpecker and the poplar borer beetle, the chickadee and the beetle, hawks and chickadees, weasels and chickadees. Uh, we see herbivory. Um, as well as uh, commensal relationships between the deer and understory plants, because they don't notice that they're carrying all those seeds. But the seeds are spread and the plant benefits. The chickadees are in competition with the red squirrels for the conifers uh, seeds. Um, and that will limit the amount of growth or how much of resource is available to each of them on their own. So it'll prevent their populations from growing too much. We even see third party species, the poplar, being harmed by the predator prey relationship between the woodpecker and the beetles. And we also see another third party species that benefits from this, the chickadees gaining nest spaces in these tree holes. Um, complex ecosystems have so many relationships and they support biodiversity. The relationships regulate the population dynamics and even in a system here that we've highly simplified, really, it is still highly complex. Oh, there we go. So we can kind of think of biodiversity as having um, a, a building having many columns or a table having many legs. Um, if each leg is a species, and as you lose legs, the table will still stand but it becomes easier and easier to topple it with smaller disturbances, the fewer legs or columns it has. Eventually it will collapse if it loses enough of those supports. So multiple species often play very similar roles in the ecosystem and will support um, biodiversity. Um, however, when disease or disturbance harms the population of a single species, other species can move in and fill that gap to some extent and in time, that species that was pushed out or died out may actually be able to reestablish uh, from the surrounding areas or seed bank. However, if you face, uh, or if the ecosystem faces a collapse on a smaller scale or even a larger scale, there won't be a space, a niche for that organism to move back into. And there may not be a seed bank um, for the organism to come from to move into that habitat again. Now, I wanna talk a little bit about disturbance. I'll keep it pretty fast here. Um, as I mentioned earlier, disturbance could be human activity, it could be fires, floods, storms, and uh, climate science is, is predicting and we are seeing that a lot of these storms are changing in their frequency and their severity. So resilient ecosystems are a really important part of climate adaptation and even climate mitigation. Um, making sure that we don't face ecosystem collapse. Um, when there is a, a reduction of species to support a function in an ecosystem, then you often have a abiotic change that results. So for example, if you have only two species on a riverbank, you have willow and water birch. They're both water loving shrubs, 
But let's say there's a particularly bad strain of willow rust that moves through and leads to the loss, total loss of those willows. The water birch remains and it holds the soil steady. However, there's not a lot of redundancy there. There's no redundancy there. So if maybe a canker fungi that can grow on, on the river birch or the water birch moves in and it kills out those or even reduces the population of those river birch, uh, the soil on the bank will be washed away, leaving behind maybe gravels and boulder. Now the species may both be present in the surrounding area, but the location itself is no longer suitable um, in its abiotic conditions and its non-living conditions for either of the species to reestablish. Um, when ecosystems cannot recover from disturbance, that's when ecological collapse occurs. And that's the severe and rapid decline in the health and functionality of the ecosystem. It eventually leads to, oh goodness, is that the time already, I guess? Huh. Okay, well, if, uh, if anyone does need to head out, um, feel free to do so, but maybe we can send out answers to these questions. Um, and I'll finish up here. Um, eco ecological collapse has a lot of implications that affect humans. Um, and it will often um, require efforts to prevent or mitigate collapse using uh, conservation, habitat restoration, sustainable resource management, uh, reduction of stressors that contribute to ecosystem degradation, which in involve invasive species management. And invasive species are a great case study for what happens when a species population is not regulated by its relationships sufficiently. Um, a lot of times these invasive species have not been in contact with the organisms that, uh, of the habitat that it's moved into. And it takes time for these relationships to establish. And these species are often highly disturbance adapted and can move into early successional um, conditions. Um, there's often a lack of coevolution between them and the organisms they are now living with. So those relationships are not helping to decrease its population over time. It will often take over, push out other species. And if it's able to push out those other species leading to ecological collapse, there is no way for those species to co-evolve as those species are no more. This is a quick demonstration of, of some of the differences between some native grassland and invasive grassland uh, or alien grassland species. Um, and these differences in root structure can also really, really change those abiotic conditions in the soil. Um, it can change even disturbance regimes, how frequently fires happen or how badly the fires are when they do occur. Um, we can also use the idea of uh, symbiosis and, and predator-prey relationships to help manage invasives. So leafy spurge uh, is managed using a biocontrol, the leafy spurge beetle. Um, and biocontrols have to be very, very carefully studied um, because you can kind of have a uh, old woman who swallowed a fly story happen um, where it um, cascades away and you end up with a bunch of new problems. Um, ultimately, land management practices, companion planting, permaculture, regenerative farming, they all take advantage of and use the ideas that um, relationships between species, biodiversity, and the resulting ecosystem services provided by healthy ecosystems and these organisms can be beneficial to our own aims, but to the e ecosystem as well. Um, in fact, we can use um, reciprocal foraging um, or really mindful foraging practices to help reduce invasive species. Um, there's a number of edible uh, Alberta invasive plants, for example, and um, do look into this before you do eat them though. Uh, some plant species only have portions of the plant that are edible and you want to make sure that you are absolutely clear in IDing them. 
and in the proper locations where you can legally forage. Um, we can also use commensal and mutualistic relationships between species that have evolved to um, human uh, foraging. And so we can help those plants grow by foraging them in um, very specific ways. Um, ecosystem services, as I said earlier, these are basically everything that allows us to live on Earth. Um, they fill our essential needs, enhance our well being. They're fundamental to our survival. Um, they're often uh, overlooked in the pursuit of economic expansion, at least just historically. And the concept of ecosystem services um, it really underscores the significance of preserving and managing ecosystems responsibly. Um, and this is coming much more into uh, policy and um, new approaches that are being researched uh, and, and different developments that are occurring um, to improve our ecosystem health in the long run. Ultimately, ecosystem services are essential for sustaining life on Earth. Recognizing the value of these services is crucial for informing our decision making, our conservation efforts, and the responsible use of natural resources. The field of ecosystem services provides a framework for understanding the interdependence between human societies and the environment, and it emphasizes the need to protect and manage ecosystems. It recognizes that, like the principle of deep ecology, humans are part of the ecosystems and the greater biosphere. And we have our own symbiotic relationships as well as our predator-prey relationships. Um, and if we recall that, we can bring that into our policies in the future. Thank you very much for joining us today. <laughs>